Well, welcome to the Keeping It Israel podcast. My name is Jeff and I'm your host. And my guest today is a returning guest from about a year ago. Michael Mastretta is the CEO of Firm, the Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries and based in Jerusalem. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's always great to be with you uh, here from Jerusalem. Hey, well, it's great to have you. And uh, we talked last time about uh, your testimony, how you got to Israel. It's a great story. And I want to just refer people back to that podcast. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, you need to hear Michael and Vanessa's story and, and how they made it to Israel, Israel and began ministry there. Uh, but Michael, today we want to talk just a little bit sort of uh, about the general principles of why Christian believers need to make a connection with Israel and why why it's so important for us to uh, to get this message out. And I wanted to say, you know, one of the earliest things that I did when I took over First Century Foundations is I heard you uh, share a bit of a testimony from Evangel Temple in Toronto about, you know, how God first spoke to you about Israel. And, and uh, that talk on Romans uh, 11, really has uh, kind of shaped some of, of what I've been teaching as well. But so thank you for that. First of all, just want to say <laughs> Absolutely. thanks. Absolutely. That's an honor. Yeah. But but let's let's go all the way back. Let's go to, to Genesis chapter 12 and talk a little bit about the covenant. God makes this covenant with Abraham. He confirms it with Isaac and Jacob. But but what was the covenant all about and and who specifically did it involve? That's that's so great, uh, Jeff, and I and I, I love talking about this because I think it's it's relevant for all of us. And I don't know everyone who's listening to your story when when you became a Christian. Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you became a Christian. But I think for a lot of us, what I realize is that we come into a movie halfway through. Sometimes you know we we, we come in kind of halfway through, and uh, sometimes we come in at Matthew chapter one, or maybe more more likely even Matthew Matthew chapter four. Uh, where Jesus shows up on the scene and he's saying, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is at hand. And it's easy to think, well, if Jesus is the, the king of the kingdom and he's, he's the one that we surrender our lives and everything to, that, that what he has to say is very important, and it, and it is. But it is like coming into a movie halfway through, which what that means is if you watch to the end, you'll, you'll figure out how it ends. You'll even figure out some of the major plot themes, but you'll never, if you, if you come in halfway, you're never going to understand the motivations of the characters. You're never going to understand all of the background, all the context. And, and so that's why I think it's so important. First and foremost, if you're saying, why are we even going back to Genesis 12? I, think, I thought it was all about Jesus to say, well, let, let's go back to the start of the movie and see um, where, where this reality of the kingdom of God and the new covenant really begins. And, and it, it begins, like you, like you said, Jeff, it begins with a man and it begins with the people. Um, as God is trying to reconcile what's happened with the fall, where he, he was walking in the garden with man uh, and woman and he was in fellowship and he wants to reconcile what happened in the fall. And we get to this dark, dark point in Genesis chapter 6 where God actually regrets making the world because of the sin and the depravity. And Genesis 12 is where we see the beginning of this plan. And God chooses a man. He chooses Abram, later changes his name to Abraham. And uh, Abraham has sons, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and, um, and, and th that becomes, the t uh, Jacob has 12 sons, and that becomes a, a tribe. And, and, and 70 people go into Egypt. And 430 years later, we have almost 3 million people coming out of Egypt. They went in at basically an extended family, and they came out uh, really as a, as a nation, almost, almost a nation, but it was, it wasn't a nation. It was a, it was a, a, a 3 million person mass of uh, former slaves <laughs> that didn't really know how to govern or didn't know anything, but God makes a covenant at Sinai and says, you will be my people. I will be your God. And they became really the first beginning uh, uh, picture of the kingdom of God, uh, the, the one nation under in the world where God rules as king. Um, and we can, mm. we can talk about what happened from beyond that, but I think that's, it's, it, it's important to frame that conversation to say everything Jesus talked about. Um, Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law, of, the, the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. 
I didn't come to contradict what was said before. I came to complete, to fulfill, to, and if we don't understand what he's fulfilling, then maybe we can appreciate part of who he is, but we can't ever really appreciate fully who he is and what he has accomplished and what that means for us as believers. So I think that's got to be the starting point. And then, of course, you know, mm-hmm. we have Genesis 12 where we say God chooses this man and he says, he makes a couple promises. He says, I, I, I'm, I'm going to make you a great nation. And, and, and you're going to have lots of descendants, descendants as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the s- grains of sand on the seashore. Um, but he says, and through your seed, all of the inhabitants of the earth will be blessed. And so maybe you're yeah. hearing this and saying, well, Michael, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the church and God, God loves the whole world. Like, like, I don't really get this whole, if you bless a certain people, a certain nation, then you'll be blessed. But, but you see in here a principle. God is choosing Abraham, and he's choosing the nation and the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and he's saying, you are going to be my example nation. You're going to be my example people. You're almost, if you would, you're going to be the, the, the firstborn son. Um, and, and I don't know, uh, again, everyone here probably has different answers to this question, but I don't know if, if anyone has siblings. Uh, so some maybe are the younger sibling or a middle child or an eldest sibling. In, in our family, I, I was the eldest. And it's easy sometimes as an eldest sibling to feel like we get the brunt of the relationship uh, from our parents. Like, like my younger sister, she could do a lot of crazy things. And I, it, it felt like my parents never disciplined her. It felt like they would, they would look at me and say, Michael, you should know better. Uh, but they would look to her and, and, and not really make a big deal about it. And I think the principle is that parents, we understand, like we, we treat the eldest child with a little bit more uh, directness and severity. We expect the younger children to watch and learn and to watch mm-hmm. and learn from the example of the eldest child, how, how, what is appropriate and how we behave in a home. And, and so if you're struggling with that, like, why did God choose this people? Well, he, he chose Israel, again, equal in value. We all, we all have value b- before God, but distinct in role and purpose. And the purpose of Israel was to be God's firstborn nation, to be an example nation, and to be the conduit of blessing to all the nations of the earth, every nation, every tongue, every tribe. And really in Genesis 12, we see the beginning of what we hear in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go into all the world. And we re- see the, the fruition of the end of the story, Revelation, where, where we see a, a multitude of every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping uh, the Lamb and the Father. Wow, that's, that's good stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm an eldest as well. And so I understand your analogy. Uh, we, we, there's a lot of benefits to being the eldest, but there's also, uh, you know, some drawbacks. And we, we do seem to get dealt with a little more, a little more uh, harshly, I guess, uh, as an example to the younger children. Uh, you know, not to whine, but my, my, my younger siblings got away with murder, uh, you know. But, uh, <laughs> I, know I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When my, when my when my sister did something wrong, she would blame it on me. Anyway, you know, you you see it happen all the time. And and I and exactly. I would just say to anyone who's a parent, you know, you love all all of your children. Um, hopefully, <laughs> if you're a good parent, you, yeah. love, you love all of your children. Um, but that doesn't mean we treat every child uh, equally. And so it's the same thing. God has a distinct role, a distinct purpose, a distinct calling for the Jewish people. And if we can see that in the Old Testament, I think then it then it just carries on to say, well, does that still exist and remain today? Right, right. Now, so so there's a good question. So first of all, you know, the covenant was about it was about people, you know, Abraham's descendants. It was about how they would impact the world and be and be blessed um, and, and bless the world as well. And it was about it was about land, too. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. There was there. There were a lot. There, he was going to give them a land. He was going to make them a great uh, multitude and descendant. And there was a blessing uh, that, that said, "Hey, those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you um, will be cursed." And that and that um, again, that, that's what we would call the Abrahamic uh, covenant. Exactly. Now, Michael, has God ever broken this covenant? I think this is a good question because uh, we have to be careful with our answer. So, if we were mm-hmm. to say, "Well, you know, God," kind of stepped away uh, from this covenant or, or this no longer exists anymore. Well, then we have to be more concerned, not about what that says about Israel, but what that says about God. And, and the, the question really at stake is, is God a covenant keeping God? Or does God, is God kind of a little bit temperamental? Is he a little 
bipolar? Does he kind of change his mind if circumstances mm-hmm. change? Or does he get so frustrated with the people that won't obey that he could finally get fed up and say, you know what, forget it. I'm going back on what I said. And the interesting thing about the Abrahamic covenant, I know sometimes we talk about Old Testament and New Testament, and we paint the picture that the, that the God of the Old Testament is, is not a God of love and mercy, but, but operates uh, with justice and judgment. But I want to show at this very beginning covenant, you know, there, there are other ones. There's the covenant with Noah. But at this very beginning covenant, grace and mercy and unconditional love are at the center of it. Because when God uh, makes this covenant with Abraham, and, and if you look at the Hebrew, it's not the word for make a covenant. It's actually the word cut a covenant. Because covenants are something that has to be cut. There has to be something that sheds blood in order to ratify a covenant. And when, when we look at this picture, God, God puts Abraham into this sleep. And in this dream state, Abraham sees all of these animals that are, are cut in half in front of him. Um, and, and this is how in, in olden times, when there was a covenant that was going to be cut, whether that was a marriage covenant or any sort of covenant, um, you know, so, so there had to be animals that were slaughtered. They, they, w- they would cut. There would be blood. And, and literally the two parties that were making the covenant would walk through these, these animals that were, had been cut in two, and they would walk through one at a time. And basically what they were saying is, if I so break this covenant – then, then you have the right to do to me what, what was done to these animals. That was, right. that was the picture. That was the imagery. That, again, it's not just a promise. It's not just a pinky promise. It's not just something you put on, post on Instagram. It's a covenant. It's, there's, <laughs> there's severity to that. Yeah. Um, and, and what I think is so interesting is God puts Abraham into this sleep. And Abraham starts to get nervous. Abraham's like, I am cutting a covenant with God. Like, if I screw up, what is going to happen? Like, I don't want to end up like those animals. Uh, but when God yeah. puts Abraham in, into uh, the sleep, we actually see in this, in this vision, in this dream state, God, these two symbols for the image of God, walk through those animals twice. So not only did God walk through once for himself, but he walks through uh, for Abraham's behalf as well. And I think what a, what a beautiful picture of the gospel that God says, I'm making a covenant with you, and not only am I holding up my end of the covenant, but I, I'm, I'm on the line for your end of the covenant. So if, if you don't obey all the terms of the covenant, I'm not going to do it to you. Then, and something like this has to happen to me. And again, this is all just a picture of the gospel, right? We, we can see the traces of Yeshua here saying, even though God walked through twice, and even when we, are, um, when we break the covenant, when we fail in our relationship with God, when we sin, God is faithful and just, and he sees the atonement of Yeshua and, and, and renders that to our account. So I think that's just such a beautiful picture. And again, this is where we as a younger child can look at Israel as an example and say, wow, God is wanting to speak something to us about his character and his nature. Oh, that's good stuff. And I wanted to get to that picture. That's beautiful. God going through the halves twice and, and you know, Abraham sound asleep. So this makes this for me, this this unconditional covenant that God makes with yeah, with Israel, very good. God, you know, God makes other promises to Israel, and he and he puts some parameters around them. You know, he says he says unless you do this, uh, you know, I won't do this, or or I will do this if you do this. But in this particular case, there's no condition, and so when we see. Uh, God, you know, exiling the Israelites to, uh, you know, to Persia, to Babylon. Uh, we, we don't assume that God is abandoning uh, Israel. We know that, that there are consequences to our actions. And, uh, and yet, you know, God, I love that picture of mercy and grace that you talked about. God, no matter what, you know, God is still there for his people, Israel. And that's, that's great. So, so let me ask you this. Is the nation or the people of Israel still God's chosen people? Or has the church replaced Israel according to the Bible? That's a, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll pull something out of the Old Testament, and something out of the New. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we look at Jeremiah, and many of us, uh, if you're listening to this and you feel like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a New Covenant believer, um, you know, and I know Jesus instituted the New Covenant at that Last Supper uh, meal. It was also a Passover meal. Um, but where did that New Covenant come from? Who was it promised to? It comes, you've got to go all the way back to Jeremiah 31 and see that that, that that new covenant was promised to the Jewish people, to the people of Israel. And just afterwards in Jeremiah, God says, 
you know, if it, when the sun stops rising in the sky or if the stars stop hanging in the sky, it, as long as the sun keeps going up and setting and everything, the, the nation of Israel will, will be my people, will be before me. We see countless times where God even says in Ezekiel uh, 36, he says, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel. And he's talking to the, the Jewish people, the house of Israel. He says, not for your sake I'm about to ask, act, but I'm about to act for the sake of my holy name that w- that's been profaned among the nations. So we really see God's reputation is at stake. And I think this carries all the way into the New Testament. When, when we get to the climax of the book of Romans, which I, I would say, you know, right at the end of Romans chapter 8, um, and most theologians would agree, you know, Romans 8, we're talking about we're more than conquerors in Christ. You know, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. All things work together for the good of those who love him. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. All these amazing statements. And the very next verse is Romans chapter 9, verse 1. And sometimes we skip over this. We skip straight to Romans chapter 12. But this, these three chapters of Romans 9, 10, and 11, what does Paul say? He goes from this amazing declaration that we are more than conquerors, that nothing can separate us, to Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 5, where he says, I have this great sorrow and this never-ceasing anguish. And I remember when I read that, if you listen to the other podcast, I probably shared this uh, story, but I remember when I first read that and thought, what are you talking about, Paul? What is this great sorrow? What is this never ceasing anguish? You just gave us all this good news. And now you're telling me that there's, that there's something heavy on your heart. The pain doesn't go away. And he says, I I, I wish I was even maybe cut off from, from, from Yeshua, from Jesus. Why? For the sake of my brothers, according to the flesh, he's very clear for the sake of the Jewish people. To them belong the adoption and the giving of the law and the covenant. Everything I, I've been sharing, the new covenant was promised to Israel. The, 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 the law was given to Israel. The adoption of sons and daughters was given to Israel, given to Abraham and his descendants. And, and Paul has this heart, and he asks these very difficult questions where he says, what happened? If, if God says in the Old Testament to Israel, the, the, the Jewish people, Israel, uh, you, you will be my people and I will be your God. And yet, when the Messiah shows up, the majority of the Jewish community rejects his Messiahship. Well, then we have a problem. Either God is not capable of accomplishing what he promised, or he, 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 maybe he changed his mind and he says, I, just uh, forget it. I'm, I'm done with his people. I'm going go, to go do it with the Gentiles. I'm going to go do it with the church. And both are problematic because both would really impugn the reputation of God. Either he's not a, his word is not powerful to accomplish all that it intends, or God is uh, uh, volatile and he changes his mind and he's not the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's where Paul um, comes in in Romans 11, and he says this very clearly. Again, given all this context, now I want to read some verses from Romans chapter 11. He says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Mm-hmm. Paul says it very clearly. He says, by no means. He says, I, I myself am an Israelite. I'm descended of Abraham. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And he goes down. Um, I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but we're going to, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll jump a little bit. Uh, in verse 11, Romans 11, 11, he says, so then I ask again, did, did they stumble? Did the Jewish people stumble in order that they might fall away? And Paul says again, by no means. He says, rather, through their trespass, through their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. That, that is a profound statement mm-hmm. that Israel stumbled. Israel temporarily stumbled over the stumbling stone of Yeshua. They, they, they stumbled to accept him as Messiah, not because it's a change in God's plan, but there was a purpose in that stumbling. Salvation has now come to all the nations of the world. Just, just think of that. Even in Israel's and the Jewish people's unfaithfulness, they have accomplished and fulfilled the promise God made to Abraham. They have been a blessing to all the nations of the world, even when it maybe wasn't intentional on their part. Right. And, and even that salvation coming to the Gentiles, it's not ultimate. God says the salvation's come to you Gentiles so as to make you, so to make Israel jealous if their trespasses mean riches for the world if their failure means riches for the gentiles how much more will their full inclusion bring 
And I think that's just such a, such a, a, a beautiful picture um, of the, the love of God where he says, I, I'm not changing my plan in spite of man's faithlessness, in spite of times where the people of Israel have not obeyed and they disobeyed. That has not hijacked my plan. In fact, it's actually accelerated my plan. Yeah. Wow. That is good stuff. So here's the question I have for you today. You know, we, we've just recently come through a, a time of, uh, or you have a time of, of conflict there in Israel. And it seems to me like whenever this happens, uh, you know, all of the all of the people with opinions about Israel kind of come out of the woodwork. Of course, you know, we are vocal. I'm, I'm vocal about supporting Israel in these moments. I'm vocal about, uh, about upholding Israel's right to defend herself and, and all of those kinds of things. But, but there are a lot of people who have been very vocal in, in other ways. And I want to ask you this, uh, you know, who represents biblical Israel today what's what's your answer to that question uh, you know it's, 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 a, it's a big question and i would say even some of the jewish community sometimes debates this yes um but by and large i i, I would say that the jewish people today um, would represent those from the the tribe of judah and also from the tribe of benjamin those that were part of the southern uh kingdom a lot of the northern tribes maybe we don't know of but there's also a lot of evidence that the jewish people of today uh you have some levites you have some from the levitical tribes and other tribes that are also um there you have, you have some people ethiopian jews so by and large i would say the jewish people today would represent the biblical um people of israel and what what, what we would say is this I think we need to have a love for Israel and for the Jewish people. I think we need to be vocal about it. I think we need to see what our role um, as believers around the world, uh, what, what your role is in terms of building up the body here in the land. I think you guys do that amazingly as first century foundations and and, and all of your partners that, that contribute not just – to a, a physical restoration of Israel, but a spiritual restoration and building up of the local body. So mm. I think that's incredible. Um, I, but, I, but I think it is important, and here's what we've tried to do with FIRM, to, to temper what we say, hey, we unequivocally stand with Israel and the Jewish people and their right to a homeland and their right to um, uh, uh, defend themselves and their, their, their right to, to exist here in the land. We, we, we say that. At the same time, I think we need to be able to speak with some empathy and compassion about uh, Palestinians and Arab people that are not not the ones that want to hate Israel, not the ones that want to uh, annihilate Israel, but really are caught in the crossfire that are s sometimes suffering under the consequences of their own leadership. Um, some of them who are led by, by you know, certified terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. organizations Canada and the U.S. and other countries would say it's a terrorist organization. So, so how do we talk and say, hey, we unequivocally say we got to love Israel and the Jewish people and love the modern state of Israel. But at the same time, we, we have compassion and empathy for all people. And if our witness as believers in the land is to be uh, sound, we, we, we need to be able to show love and, and compassion to everyone who's hurting. And, and, and then on the other side, I would say, you know, we, we love and pray for our leaders, but we know politicians are, are, are not perfect. And they're also not men and women of God. And so we don't get behind political parties and political systems. And we don't, we also don't say that Israel's perfect. Israel's a democracy in the Middle East. It's amazing. We try as best as possible to preserve life, but our politicians are not all believers. None of them are really believers and, and they're not perfect and they're not godly and all righteous. And so how do we as a gospel centered in a gospel centered way say, we're going to stand on biblical principles. We're going to show compassion and empathy to everyone who's hurting. And we're not going to get behind a political agenda when we know God has a spiritual solution for this land and this people. And, and that's, that's the approach we've tried to take. Um, you know, it's, we're not saying that we don't have empathy for those who, uh, who have been affected and who are dying. There, there's some of it that's a truth thing, like how much is accurate coming out of uh, Gaza? A lot of the media is controlled by mm -hmm. Hamas, who has their own agenda. And so just trying to discern the truth, say what, what is a political agenda and what is truth and what, what is God's heart for us to do? And then how do we engage in a gospel centered way. And, and, and if there, if there are, and there are people who are hurting on both sides of the hatred and the tension, how do we as believers bring hope and healing in the name of Yeshua? Amen. 
well, well articulated. And thank you for that, because I think that's going to help a lot of people who are listening. You know, we uh, have have taken a similar approach. I mean, I, I, I mentioned that uh, during the recent conflict, a lot of opinions have sort of been coming at us and uh, we actually we actually had to shut our Facebook page down for a few days because of so much uh, hatred and anti-Israel uh, venom that was being being spewed toward us. I, I think it was yeah. a I think it was a calculated attack, actually, um, you know, using bots or yes. algorithms or something, because, it, you know, as, as quickly as a comment would be deleted and a user banned, someone another one would pop up or five more would pop up. It was it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. However, um, you know, we well, and, and, sorry, go ahead. No, and, and, and I just think that it, it's important to talk about the demonic attack yeah. on the Jewish people. I mean, it wasn't it, – it, most recently we can see the Holocaust, but we can also see um, Haman in the book of Esther and just this, this desire to annihilate a people. I, I really believe – it's for a couple reasons. One, God said the seed was going to come through Abraham's seed. So if, if you were Satan and you were trying to uh, form a strategy, wouldn't it make sense? Let's annihilate the people that God said the, the, the Messiah was going to come through. Right. Not just that, but we don't have time to go into this. But in Matthew 23, uh, Jesus says, I'm, I'm only going to return to earth, to Jerusalem, when the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem say, welcome, Baruch haba, Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of yeah. the Lord. So Satan wanted to annihilate the Jewish people. For, for the first coming of Yeshua, he wants to annihilate the Jewish people for the second coming of Yeshua. Yeah. And, and the demonic hatred that you see in these comments. I mean, why, if you, even if you're anti-Israel, why would you beat up a Jewish person in L.A.? Why would you yeah. uh, go around London screaming death to Jews or, or rape the Jews? There's something demonic there. And that hatred, that demonic hatred of the Jewish people that's age old is having negative ramifications, not just on the Jewish people, but on the Palestinians. The Palestinian peoples are suffering because of the hatred of their leaders that is causing them, you know, all sorts of corruption and uh, uh, retaliation and all of that. And so if we can just, uh, not, again, we don't engage against flesh and blood, but we, against spiritual principalities and authorities, that demonic spirit that says we want to annihilate the Jewish people, that's hurting not just Jewish people, but but Arabs as well in Israel and also in the West Bank and in Gaza. Um, that's what we really need to come against as believers. Amen. That's great. Those are great thoughts. And what I was about to say was this, you know, um, I think it's fair to say that that modern Israel um, as a as a, a group of people living in a geographic location, uh, put it that way, uh, has to be representative in some way of biblical Israel simply because of the fact that this is the the largest concentration of Jewish people on the smallest uh, you know area of of geography in the world right now. W would that be fair? Very fair. And the fact that we're speaking a language, a uh, modern version mm -hmm. of a language that has been uh, you know carried down two thousand years later. Um, the fact that you've seen over the last 73 years, uh, you've seen over land, sea, and air, millions and millions of Jewish people come back from the four corners of the earth. Literally, it's nothing, nothing other than a, a modern-day uh, miracle. And, and, and I think what always challenges me when I first got into Israel stuff, and maybe you're new to this, uh, God says in the book of um, Exodus, he says, in that day, you, you, I'll no longer be known as the one who delivered you out of Egypt, but as the one who brought you from the north and the south and the east and the west and all the corners of the earth back to Israel. So he's actually saying, I, I know you know me as the God that led you out of Egypt and the Exodus story and the crossing of the Red Sea, but a greater miracle than that is actually what we're experiencing today. And I think that's, that's humbling. That's, uh, that's, that's just awe-inspiring to me, almost fearful to say, wow, we're living in the midst of, of a modern-day miracle that God says is even greater than the miracle of part in the Red Sea. Amen. So summarize for me then, you know, why, why should believers in North America, why should believers in other parts of the world uh, be supportive of, of Israel? Uh, well, I, I would say that if, if you're wondering why Israel matters, the first thing I'd say, and this is a purely uh, selfish thing uh, on your part, I, I would say it's important because it adds value to your faith. Uh, it adds hair. It, it taps into the heritage and the root of your faith. And you, you can while you can love and serve Jesus without loving Israel, uh, it's hard to truly understand Jesus if you don't understand his people and his land and the place where he came from. So first and foremost, just even purely selfishly, if you if you want to 
the biblical principle of being blessed or you want you want it to be a blessing to your mm-hmm. faith uh, i think that's where it, where, where it starts and i think as we see the value israel provides that that leads us to gratitude uh, and then I, w- I would just challenge us with the words of paul in romans chapter 9 those first five verses uh, when we see the reality of the situation that that the people to whom jesus came and the place from which the gospel went around the world now very small believing body in the land less than a quarter of one percent are believers so that that should lead us to sorrow that, that should lead us yeah. to this biblical i say that like a canadian right <laughs> uh, that should lead us to a biblical sorrow um um and and and, and just I, I would i would say if you read what paul said in romans 9 verse 1 to 5 and you say man i can't relate with that just w- would you even pray god give me your heart God, would you would you give me the emotions that Paul feels? I don't I don't feel them, but I know there's something there. Would you would you show me what that is? And then finally, I would just say because it's our calling as believers around the world. When you get to Romans 11, you see it's it's the nations showing Israel mercy, showing Israel compassion, bringing the gospel to Israel. That that is the thing that provokes Israel to jealousy. So it's part of our calling, and that should lead us. Uh, to action. I can't think of a better way to do that than what you guys are doing for, for with First Century Foundations. I don't just say that. I really mean it. You guys have been pioneers in this for decades, uh, not just saying, hey, we should love Israel as a modern state, but how do we lift up the arms of believers in the land in a gospel-centered way? And I think that's the best way uh, that anyone can engage in uh, Jewish ministry. Good words. And, uh, you know, thank you for saying nice things about FCF, but, but also uh, you are leading the Fellowship of Israel-related ministries, uh, many of the same ministries that we're engaged with, you're helping, and, and some others that you're not. But tell us a little bit about that work and, and how people can practically engage with what you're doing at FIRM. Yeah, so we, I mean, at our heart is, is so similar and so aligned. I think that's why we have a deep friendship and longstanding relationship. We want to we wanna help strengthen, unite, and resource local ministries to transform lives in Israel. And so even just most recently, um, we, we saw what was happening. And so we rolled out this hope and healing campaign, kind of an emergency crisis fund to say, hey, how, how can we come in the opposite spirit of the hatred, of the tension, of the anger, of, of, of just this spirit of darkness and come with a spirit and message of hope and healing? And and, and it's been amazing. We've, we've had six main objectives to, you know, uh, help displaced families and affected uh, uh, families and to help those who've had property damage from rockets and counseling for kind of PTSD yeah. that could come and, and opportunities to serve in communities where there's been a lot of civil unrest, all of that. And, and, and it's been amazing. And, and 100% of what we raised from that, we're, we're blessing the local body um, towards that. So, so those are the kinds of things that we do. We're, we're trying to help, again, help ministries uh, increase their capacity. Um, get healthy, think, think uh, uh, strategically about new ways of reaching people, help ministries work together, saying, hey, there's only, there's only 30,000 or so of us mm-hmm. in the whole country. If we, if we work together, how can we make Yeshua famous in this nation? And finally, um, um, just that piece of um, strength and unite and also to resource. How can we practically meet needs uh, that are on the ground? So uh, we're, we're, excited. we're happy to be partners with FCF in this. Uh, because I think it's an important work and it's a, it's a global message we have. Um, so the one other thing I just say, and I mentioned this last time on the podcast as well, is uh, we hope to be a resource to help uh, people that can't come to Israel right now because if you're in Canada, you just really can't go anywhere. Sure. <laughs> but, but if you're uh, anywhere in the world, it's hard to come to Israel uh, right now. We have the first tour groups coming, but it's very, very restricted. So we have, we have a resource called Israel U. Uh, that's Israel, the letter U dot org. Uh, that are these, just these five minute videos that help, again, show how Israel adds value to your faith. And it can help you understand your Bible in deeper ways. So you can go to Israel U dot org dot org. Um, that's a great resource. And we just, again, we hope to make it easy and, and simple for people to, to love Israel in a gospel sense. And your website, firm's website, just give us that quickly so that uh, our listeners will have it. Y- yes. So that's firm, that's firm, F I R M, Israel.org. So firm, Israel.org. Uh, that's where you can find out about us and, and, and read about local ministries and, and, and keep in touch for uh, updates of what's happening from the And remind me one last time, what's the, what's the new campaign called? It's called the Hope and Healing Campaign. So if you go to firmisrael.org slash hope, um, it's there. It's still up on our homepage for a little while longer. Um, and we're, we're very, very close to meeting our goal, actually. But if you want to uh, sow into the campaign, that's, that's blessing, again, both Jews and Arabs uh, that have been affected by the most recent violence 
and crisis and also a, a reserve fund to continue helping when these kind of uh, episodes come up. Okay, great. Well, listen, I want to say to anybody who's watching, anybody who's listening here in Canada in particular, that uh, if you designate to First Century Foundations, if you designate to that hope and healing campaign for firm, uh, we're going to send 100% of those designated funds to help with uh, with this uh, work that you're doing. And if you meet your goals, then please put it into uh, your reserve fund so that you can you can continue to uh, to meet those needs. We would love to be able to uh, to partner in that way. Uh, yeah, and it, amazing. It, Amazing. Yeah. Thank you, if you guys. Give, that means a lot. Give in Canada through through us, then you get a tax receipt for your donations, and you're able to help these uh, these ministries in Israel through Firm. And so, Michael, great to have you uh, on the podcast again today. We maybe went a little over our half hour, but there's always so much to talk about. And uh, want to send our love to Vanessa and to little Azariah. Uh, first, you know, before you say goodbye, uh, just tell us about this incredible new blessing in your life. Yeah, it's been amazing to be a dad. I mean, it gives me a whole new yeah. perspective on things. We've been praying for a, a child for a long time, dealt with some infertility and, and miscarriages. And uh, and even our little Azariah had a little health scare when he was born. Uh, he, had, he had a stroke at birth. Um, and we had so many people praying from around the world. I know, Jeff, uh, you and your wife and, and so many others were, were praying. And he's Praise totally God. whole, totally healthy. We're taking him wow. in for another MRI in a few weeks. But just... Uh, really a testament to the healing power Praise of the God. Lord. So uh, such a blessing. And we're, we're extra we're extra blessed to have them every day, especially because of what we've been yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are a joy. And uh, I know that uh, you guys are going to be amazing, already are amazing parents, but you're going to be amazing parents. And, and he's going to grow up in just such an incredible uh, situation there. Um, uh, I just, I think the future is bright. I think the future thanks, is Jeff. bright. Well, thanks again, Michael. God bless. God bless. I was a pastor for over 20 years before I first went to Israel, only to realize that I was totally disconnected from the roots of my faith. Since then, I've been on a journey of discovery and my faith has come alive in ways I never could have imagined. I'm Jeff Uters, Executive Director of First Century Foundations, and I'm excited to invite you to explore the land of the Bible and to discover your part in a Bible story that isn't over yet. First Century Foundations exists to reconnect Christians to the foundations of Christianity. And we do this by creating Bible-based media focused on Israel, but we don't just reconnect you to Israel in the Bible. We help you participate in what God is doing in Israel today by connecting you to over 70 ministries in Israel who desperately need our support. Will you partner with us? Together, we'll explore Israel's biblical past while playing our role in Israel's bright future.